Thank you for joining us on Desiring God Live. I'm David Mathis, and we are privileged to have with us here this afternoon, Jared Wilson. Jared, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Jared is the author of the book, Gospel Wakefulness. He's also pastor of Middletown Springs Community Church in Middletown, Ver Middletown Springs, Vermont. That's right. And he is joining us here in the Twin Cities for the first time. Is that right? It is. Yeah, I'm excited about the uh, Monday Night Football game tonight. That's right. I'll be rooting for the Vikings just for your sake. Thank you very much. <laughs> very wise decision. Um, well, we want to dive in and talk about the book he's written called Gospel Wakefulness. Um, Jared begins the book by talking about a kind of gospel renaissance. Actually, in the foreword, Ray Ortland writes about the gospel renaissance. And some are saying there's a kind of gospel renewal or resurgence or awakening that seems to be happening in our day. Uh, you seem to sense that as well. If so, what makes you think that this is the case? Well, I think we have a lot of good evidences to believe that that's the case. I certainly hope that's the case. Um, you know, beginning with, you know, some of the, uh, you know, the social research or the, you know, sociological studies done to, you know, to kind of tap into that young restless and reform movement, I think Colin um, Hansen pinpointed in a Christianity Today article, which was five or six years ago, I think. Um, but just to look at the resurgence in not just gospel talk or the, you know, this interest in what the gospel is and the gospel-centered movement, um, but sort of a, a return among, uh, especially a younger generation, but a return to uh, expository preaching, a return mm -hmm. to an interest in um, uh, a more robust theology and, and that sort of thing. And, and even sort of um, the, um, the more visible or the, the higher emphasis that we're seeing in, in sort of missional efforts and uh, world missions, um, I see it even in sort of the newer emphasis on um, um, in the adoption movement mm -hmm. and, and all of that sort of thing. It just seems to be these various streams coalescing to show that God is doing something um, fresh and, and um, not new in the sense of something he's never done before, but just sort of a, a renewal or as uh, Ray would say, a, a renaissance, I guess, among mm -hmm. evangelical churches. Well, the book in particular isn't about the renaissance at large, but about personal gospel wakefulness. Would you situate the book for us uh, as it relates to that broader context? Sure. Well, uh, just, you know, from my own, um, my own walk with the Lord and anecdotally hearing stories from people throughout the church uh, who seem to have uh, this similar story, just keep hearing the same kind of personal history repeated over and over again. And, um, you know, for many it's um, having grown up in the church, grown up evangelical, um, you know, been exposed to a steady diet of, you know, biblical teaching and um, knowing the gospel, but in, in some way the gospel being um, uh, an implication or being implied mm -hmm. and, and not, um, you know, an explicit or, you know, you know kind of the centerpiece of, um, of Christian life. And so what I'm hearing and what I have uh, experienced as well is there seems to be this thing that occurs um, for um, people in these positions where there's a moment in time where the gospel becomes so real, un unavoidably, um, undeniably real and, and imminent in, in their lives um, to where it, it, it's like a, um, if they weren't saved before, they are now, you know, kind of thing. Some people may describe it as this is when I was saved. Others say, you know, as you know, C.S. Lewis um, you know, said to his friend in a letter, you know, you always think you, you know, believe what you believe, but you find out you just believe that you believed, mm -hmm. and now it's something has become so real. Um, you know, Lewis said a great joy had befallen him, and it's, you know, it's kind of that sense, like um, someone's pressed the fast forward button in, um, in, in sanctification, and um, suddenly there's like a warp speed jump to the gospel becoming more um, more urgent in, in, in our lives. Mm -hmm. So I want to come back and define gospel wakefulness, mm -hmm. but first I want to define gospel. Okay. You say in the book, at least twice, if not more, that an implied gospel is a gospel fail. That's right. So let's not fail here. Okay. Let's, let's not imply the gospel, <laughs> but what is the gospel? Yeah, I think you're right. I, I think as we throw the gospel out and, and in, in some way, in some appropriate way, sometimes it becomes a word of utility, especially mm -hmm. when we 
begin adding it to centered and driven and, and that sort of thing, or we begin to talk about gospel marriages and, and that kind of thing. Um, we can be throwing the word out without ever defining our terms. I think there's a lot of different ways to define the gospel, but the gospel um, is essentially, it is the announcement, it's news, it's um, you know, the story of what Christ has done, so it's not um, advice, it's not instruction, it's not steps or tips. It is, um, I think Packer's definition is um, that the gospel is that God saves sinners through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you see that um, fairly well reflected, or you see the basis of that, like in 1 Corinthians 15, in the opening verses, or, you, you know, Paul's just laying out history. He, you know, it's not, um, you know, he's got the implications later in the chapter, and, and you know, as he surveys uh, the resurrection and kind of the fallout, you know, the beautiful fallout of the resurrection. But when he says, I want to remind you of this gospel, you know, that I preached to you, it's of first importance. He's essentially saying this is something that happened literally um, in history that Jesus did. He lived a sinless life. He died a sacrificial, substitutionary death uh, and rose again on the third day bodily um, um, glorified. And that historical announcement is the gospel. And so then you talk about gospel wakefulness. That's the topic of the book. What do you mean by this term gospel wakefulness? Um, It is... uh, there's a variety of ways um, to talk about it. it it's astonishment. Um, I found for some folks a, a helpful way to compare it to parallel is sort of say it's, it's like revival or um, you know, renewal, but on a personal scale. So some people have, they have some sort of framework for thinking about um, you know, when revival comes to a church, you know, all came down mm-hmm. um, to a church. Well, it's, it's like that, but on a personal level. Um, I kind of describe it in the book as, as you know, sort of this, you know, this leap ahead that the Spirit works in our life, in our sanctification, where um, in the midst of a profound brokenness, which I, I think is necessary for the wakefulness to happen, where all other idols, all other means of satisfaction and support are, you know, not by our choice, but by circumstances and, and the sovereignty of God are taken away from us. And suddenly God is our only hope. And when He's our only hope, then He becomes our only hope. And... Uh, in that moment, there is a great joy that happens. In, in um, 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, Paul is, writes to the church and he said, you receive the word in much affliction with the joy of the Spirit. And that's what instilled in them or, or, or was the catalyst for the church becoming imitators of him and of the Lord is that receiving, um, when the intersection of the gospel with brokenness occurs, that's where wakefulness can happen. Here was, a, I think, a helpful summary. This is near the end, page 214. You said, gospel wakefulness is simply this, astonishment over the fact that God has forgiven our sin and reconciled us eternally to Him through the life, death, and resurrection of His Son, Jesus Christ. So, as you say throughout the book, uh, often, maybe you'd go with that word often, uh, (laughs) we come into an initial understanding, embrace, belief, saving belief in the gospel. And then at some later point, you say sometimes it's gradual, Sometimes at a later point where we're astonished by the gospel in yeah. a way we never have been. Yeah. How about uh, those categories of when is gospel wakefulness conversion? It's just a new birth. Right. Uh, and you said sometimes it happens gradually, and then for others it's a, it's a moment in time. Could you put those three into perspective? Yeah, I, I don't equate um, gospel wakefulness. Right? I say, you know, it's not s- synonymous with conversion. Uh, but for many, it's simultaneous. And throughout the book, um, you know, there's these, um, in most chapters, there's a personal story, somebody's, um, you know, story of gospel wakefulness in their own words. And for some of them, um, that moment came for them, that astonishment, that kind of leap ahead, um, of, you know, a fresh, enduring, dazzling, uh, you know, of them, um, you know, by what Christ has done, uh, occurred later in their Christian life. They had had some sort of conversion experience. They had... Um, you know, experienced uh, or, or had good evidence of um, regeneration, conversion in their life, but this sort of um, reviving experience, this enduring wakefulness didn't occur till later. But for some, um, that starkness began the moment that they were converted. And what I have found, this is just sort of a, um, anecdotal as well, is I think those for whom gospel wakefulness is simultaneous with conversion tend not to have grown up in the church. So there's a a greater starkness to the repentance mm-hmm. that you know takes place um, when they're exercising saving faith. They know specifically what they've left behind, and so 
Um, it's not, um, you, know, you know, for someone like me or others who might have grown up, um, quote unquote, good, you know, mm -hmm. um, unsaved, but, you know, in a, in a good Christian family, going to church, doing good things, the difference between that and those first kind of baby steps of, of saving faith may not be as stark uh, as for those who um, they know exactly what they're converting from and what they're turning away from. Um, so I don't say that they're um, synonymous. Uh, sometimes they're simultaneous. And, and I just know um, one of the examples in the book is Keith Green, who, you know, um, repented, was saved, began a ministry, uh, you know, was married, you know, he repented from drugs, he repented from living, and, uh, you know, with his wife before she, you know, he was married to her, you know, he repented of this new age Eastern spirituality, began his ministry, it was fruitful, and, um, you know, people were coming to Christ through him. And then there's this one moment where uh, he got away for prayer and, and, you know, solitude with the Word of God. And the next morning he says, you know, he announces, I got saved last night. And um, as his widow, you know, says in the biography, she goes, well, if he was saved last night, what was he before? Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't want to argue with a dead guy because he knows his story better than I do. But, you know, I look at that and say, you know, I, I think there's good evidence to see that he was regenerate before that. But this could be his, his wakefulness moment, his, his um, where the astonishment really, you know, settled in for him. And so for the viewer, for the reader, uh, you think it's helpful that we have this category, uh, given that often as we describe our experience, our story, our journey, mm -hmm. there seems to be a conversion point and a later place where we're awakened with freshness. Right. And you give some biblical texts, uh, but it seems maybe you're building your case in particular with here's a, a helpful category for a phenomenon that right. is occurring and being described. How would you describe that? Well, you know, hearing from people who read the book or who have um, encountered me using this phraseology on, you know, on my blog or elsewhere, um, it, had, it has appeared helpful to them because what they're saying is this happened to me and I, I didn't have words for it. I didn't have a, a label for this. And as they are trying to tease out was I not saved beforehand, and am I saved by this? I, I think it's ultimately helpful and adorns the gospel more to separate those concepts out so that we don't equate um, a feeling or a, you know, a, a certain spiritual experience or a moment of awe with salvation so that we can always say, um, you, know, you know, salvation is based on the finished work of Christ, and Christ's work is sufficient, and it's so sufficient that it even covers you know, our, when we're grumpy and um, when uh, we're experiencing this, you know, experiencing the shoddy Christian life, I suppose. And so it's not to say that, um, you know, someone could not have, um, uh, someone wasn't saved uh, before all or before this moment. You know, people who are saved are changed. Their heart is changed. Um, but to separate the concepts out or to create these two categories, I think, can be helpful. Um, firstly, t you know, to give kind of voice to how people are experiencing their Christian walk, um, but also to make sure that we maintain the distinction about what causes salvation. It's not a walking the aisle or praying a certain prayer or, or a moment of wakefulness. What causes salvation is what Christ has done and how the Spirit applies that work to our heart. So if, if you're teaching systematic theology through the, uh, the ordo salutis, order mm -hmm. of salvation, uh, will you describe the effectual call and you'll talk about the new birth and faith and repentance. And then would, would you talk about gospel wakefulness before or after sanctification <laughs> on the way to glorification? Or? Uh, no, I probably would okay. not do that. Yeah. That's helpful. Okay. Um, I, I think it would be helpful for us now to hear some of your story of gospel wakefulness. You, you refer to it several times throughout the book. And uh, this is not something you're merely writing about, but something you have experienced. Right. It's essential that this be experienced personally. Right. So would you walk us through that story of how God brought you to the point of despairing of self yeah. and into gospel wakefulness? Yeah, well, it was a, um, you know, a beautiful convergence of um, testimony of how God turns, you know, can't turn evil to good or how mm -hmm. he uses evil for good. I grew up in, you know, in the church. Uh, you know, I was raised in the Southern Baptist Church and was a good kid you know, quote unquote, good, um, you know, all my life, you know, believe I was called into ministry when I was uh, in middle school. Um, so, you know, always had designs on following God, uh, wanting to be a pastor when I grew up and that sort of thing. Um, but never the gospel for me 
and for the churches that I grew up in was always uh, either implied or it was sort of tacked on you know, to the end of kind of a moralistic message, that sort of thing. So the gospel, um, it was communicated in so many words. The gospel is for unsaved people. It is only for lost people. Once you become a Christian, you've graduated onto something else. You've moved on to something else. So I didn't have that established in my heart, this sense of, of awe over what Christ had done for me. It was sort of like, that's an entry ticket, and now I'm awed by you know, all these assortment of other things, different aspects of theology like end times or, or what have you, Calvinism and Arminianism and that sort of deal. And what happened, you know, you know, for me, growing up in the church, got married, and spent really about nine years um, crushing my wife's heart through uh, inattentiveness and um, a, a lack of gentleness. And, um, you know, the, there was secret sin for me going on that time. I was unrepentantly indulging in pornography. And, and there's no way that can't affect a marriage and almost every other relationship, you know, that someone is in. So um, it was a combination of that um, unrepentant sin, um, the, the failure, the mess that I was making of my relationship with my wife, um, also, just the other sorts of things that I wanted to do with my life didn't seem to be panning out. I wanted to be a writer. It wasn't working. I, I knew I wanted to be in ministry. I didn't understand at the time that God was, I believe, keeping me out because I was unqualified. I wasn't qualified for ministry. And, um, you know, so kind of at the center of um, the mess or the ruin of my life, you know, the failure that I, I felt I was, was then uh, my wife basically saying, I don't want to be married to you anymore. I don't, I don't love you anymore. I don't, you know, this is not what I wanted and, and I don't believe you're going to change and, and I'm not going to change to love you anymore through this. And, um, so, you know, so my marriage was dead and my marriage was an idol for me, which sounds really um, odd to people who hear the story because you think if, if you worship your wife or you um, have your marriage as an idol, um, you, um, you take care of it or you're, you're nice to it or you praise it and that sort of thing. But we, anything that we create an idol of, we abuse. I mean, it's just we're misusing it. If you put the weight of God on something that's not God, um, not only are you going to crush your own spirit, but you, you crush that thing. You're not using it the way it's designed to use. So um, I had made a mess in my life. So, you know, there was a period of, de of depression that I had enter um, entered into. And it was in those moments where everything was taken away from me. The thing that, that I said was most important to me, um, that I believe was most important to me, um, you know, that sinfully I had placed in the place of God was now taken away. And I had nothing. Um, you know, I had, you know, periods of feeling suicidal and, um, you know, the ups and downs of depression where you're numb for long periods of time. You don't feel anything to then just profound sadness and brokenness and not wanting to even exist. And, and then thinking sort of pridefully, admirably, well, I'll make their life better by taking myself out since I've caused all this pain. The reason, you know, um, the way that I can save them from this pain is to take myself out of this life and that sort of thing. And, it was in these moments of, um, I, I still was not receiving the gospel from the church that we were attending, um, but I was, you know, finding these streams of, um, of gospel-drenched teaching, mainly through um, the internet, was, you know, podcasting, and um, was hearing the gospel that way, praying my guts out. I was, you know, I was living in the guest bedroom at the time, you know, wasn't, you know, sleeping in the bed with my wife, and most nights I just was flat on the floor, with my face in the carpet, and um, you know, those are some of the most real prayers that you know somebody ever prays. Sometimes there's not even words; it's just like the word "please" over and over again, and that sort of thing. And um, I, I distinctly remember um, not an audible voice, but just um, I could hear these specific words that the Spirit said in my heart, um, and they were, "I approve of you." And it was like, you know, the most vivid light bulb had gone on for me. Uh, I knew that w what I was hearing was not that, you know, that God approved of what I had been doing or that, you know, my life previous, but that in Christ, He approved of me. And so at the moment that I had the most vivid realization of my sin, um, I think it's Thomas Watson who says, till sin be bitter, Christ will not be sweet. And it, it was like that. I had come to the end of myself, and suddenly here was God saying, you don't have anything else but me, and am I all that you want? And it, you know, like the disciples, I was just, well, where else can I go? You know, <laughs> only you have the words of life. And um, that was my moment of wakefulness there. I began to walk, um, you know, in repentance for that. It was probably a year or more, um, a little over a year, of being a changed, wakened, um, 
repentant person, you know, not perfect by any stretch, but, um, you know, the previous sins, I had completely lost taste for those things. I had no interest in those things. I began to pursue my wife's heart, even as she was not ready to give it to me. Mm-hmm. And so one of the ways I was evidencing my repentance, and it's one of the things I kind of talk about in the book, is a truly repentant person owns the consequences of their sin. And so one of the ways I was going to be repentant was I was going to love my wife whether she loved me back or not. I always loved her before as in sort of a legalistic way, you know, as a leveraging, waiting for her response, wanting something from her, treating her like a vending machine, using her. And this time around, you know, she'd made it clear, I don't even want to live in the same house with you. And so through the power of the gospel, I was able to love my wife. Um, and by God's grace, he was doing a work in her heart as well where she was able to come to a, a wakefulness of her own and, and uh, you know, forgive me and, you know, be reconciled to me. And, you know, so for us, you know, the theme of our life is th- that moment. We've lost, you know, even as God began to restore things to me, I can write now, I can minister now, I'm released, to, you know, into ministry and, you know, I have my marriage back. And, you know, all, as God began to put all these things together, um, not that, ten- you know, the temptation to idolatry is always there because I'm a sinful person, but... Um, I've seen in such a vivid way, you know, the glory of God um, in Jesus Christ, um, the finished work of Christ as all satisfying and beautiful. The other things take perspective now. I, I, I look at these idols and say, why would I go to that now when I know it doesn't satisfy? Um, mm. Only Christ has the words of life. Mm. Uh, there's a chapter in the book, I think it's chapter 8, mm. just called Depression. Mm. And... Uh, I would love to send all of our viewers to chapter 8, to the book in its entirety, to chapter 8. Uh, is there anything you'd want to say to those who are watching who maybe are in a season of depression right now or who have battled with depression uh, as kind of a, a foretaste that would maybe draw them to that chapter 8 for the more extended treatment? Yeah. Well, I think um, there's an encouragement. It's an ironic encouragement to those who are in, in depression because... Um, for many, depression is, is not something you ask for. It's not something that is necessarily precipitated by um, you know, a particular set of events or choices. Um, there are people who are suffering from depression, and it's, it's like it, it has happened to them, this profound sadness or a darkness that has you know, come upon somebody. Um, and when that happens, uh, it's very easy to think no one has ever felt like this ever mm. in the history of you know the earth. I'm the only one who knows what this feels like. Because um, when you're de- when you're depressed, and people are trying to cheer you up because they think that's what you need. I mean, it's something deeper than that. You know, they can seem annoying or they don't seem like they understand. Um, but if you look through the pages of Scripture, and um, that chapter you know goes through Psalm 42 and you know sees the cry of um, uh, you know of the psalmist there to um, to cry out to God. Uh, you know, you know to begin by saying. I mean, I see the words of depression on those words that, you know, as Matt Chandler would say, we put this on a coffee cup, right? As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. And we think that's so sweet, but I see the words of depression there. Mm-hmm. It's like, I'm, um, I'm thirsty, and I'm, I, I'm dying. I'm, I'm, so, you know, I'm in a desert, and I need, I need water. And God, that's how I need you. I need you that desperately. Um, and then as, as you go on, you begin, you know, to see how the psalmist is talking about, you know, all your waves and breakers are crashing over me, and my tears are my only food. and I mean, the Bible gives a voice to the depressed um, that should at the very least help us to, um, I think it's Richard Sibbs who talks about, you know, when you're in the darkness, do as sailors do and cast an anchor out into the dark. You know, you don't know where it's going to go. You don't know where you are. You can't see the horizon. Things look hopeless. But, you know, the scriptures help us to cast an anchor out and see, okay, the Spirit is here. The Spirit is working. Even if I can't feel that, even if I don't somehow see that, I can cast an anchor in the dark and, and trust that it's there. Um, but one of the reasons why I put the chapter in the book as it relates to gospel wakefulness is because one of the questions I always get is, isn't this just about feelings? I mean, you, you know, you, what you're talking about is this sort of experience, kind of an emotional type thing. And my response is, yeah, it is kind of like that. You know, I believe the Lord is the Lord of our feelings as well. Um, but what I don't want to do is um, is not making account for the different way God wires people up, the different things that uh, that um, that people experience through no choice or you know or sometimes fault of their own, like depression or or grief, which is natural and healthy and that sort of thing, and to say that the affections of our heart, wherever we top out, everyone tops out differently. So I'm in Vermont, 
And I brought my, my beautiful southern wife up to Vermont. And my wife is very effusive. And you know, she says things like, shut up. And she doesn't mean shut up. She means like, you don't say, right? <laughs> but she doesn't express it that way. She's just, because that's who she is. Um, you know, and I'm not quite there, but I'm a little more effusive than, for instance, you know, the dairy farmer who comes to my church or, uh, you know, the carpenter who, you know, with the Norwegian background and that sort of thing. So everyone's wired differently to top out at a different place emotionally or in, you know, in their affections. Everyone has that top line. It may be different. And so all I'm trying to say is, um, you know, the gospel should be the thing that, you know, the place where we top out. Um, so joy may look different for each person, but um, you know the, your ultimate joy should be in Christ wherever that is. And so for the depressed person, joy may not be um, easy to come by, or you know, you know certainly happiness is not easy to come by. Um, but there is a satisfaction to be found in Christ, um, just if you're, even if it just means clinging to the hem of His garment, you know, like the bleeding woman, to just mm-hmm. in desperation say, "This is where I'm going to you know, place my hope." right now. You say in the book that uh, the gospel is the antidote for mm-hmm. everything. Yeah. And we need to apply that to depression. We say yes in a sense and yeah. no in a sense. So let, me, uh, let me pair up a couple quotes for you and you explain through the tension what the thread of coherence is. I don't okay. think it's a contradiction. I don't think you do either. Okay. I think maybe some of our viewers would be helped. All right. You say on page 72, I uh, talk about the gospel fixes everything. We all exhibit a multitude of symptoms for our conditions, running the gamut from self-indulgent immorality to self-satisfying morality. Our sin extends to the opposite ends of the spectrum and lands everywhere in between. But whatever your symptoms, the gospel is the answer. There is no problem, pain, or perniciousness outside the universe-spanning scope of the gospel. The gospel is the antidote to everything. That's page 72. Then page 151... In the Depression chapter, you say disapprovingly that many Christians have adopted the unfortunate posture of Job's friends, adding more discouragement to those discouraged by depression by urging them not to seek help, extra help via spiritual disciplines like prayer and Bible study. Did I say that right? Urging them not to seek help except via spiritual disciplines like prayer and Bible study. Right. What is the thread of coherence there? How would you put together that, yes, the gospel is the antidote to everything, Mm -hmm. but maybe not in the way some may want to take that related to depression and other things? Well, to expand on the the quote about extra help, I I think that section comes out of um, kind of applying the common um, encouraging or um, taking the weight off of those who would be told that to avail themselves of common graces like medicine or Mm -hmm. you know seeing a counselor that sort of thing uh, would be not trusting God Mm -hmm. and I equate that to saying if you have a headache and someone takes aspirin do you say you're not trusting God Mm -hmm. for the headache you know you know God in his you know great wisdom and and goodness has given us the you know these common graces so Mm -hmm. no you know it's not an either or you know um, uh, situation for me Um, I think the coherence there and, and and I understand the question about you know the tension there is seen in the first passage where, where I talk about um, the universe-spanning, mm. um, you know, nature of the gospel, and so um, the believing in the gospel, it may not be the antidote in the sense of that it fixes, it takes the depression away this lifetime, mm. but the gospel isn't scaled to this lifetime. The gospel is scaled to eternity. So the depressed person, if that depression lasts their entire life, they can believe. Um, they can know that God is sovereign over what is uh, happening to them. And more than that, an eternal glory of of bliss with Him, fellowship with the Savior awaits where that depression is gone. And so in the light of eternity, um, even a lifelong depression is a blip on the radar. And so what you see in Psalm 42 is how the psalmist begins to talk to his own soul and he's preaching the gospel to himself. You know, why are you so downcast? Put your hope in God. And um, it's just a constant, um, repetitious practice that we have to go through. Everyone alike, not just you know depressed persons, but you know as Luther says, we have to know the gospel and we have to beat it into our heads continually mm-hmm. because we just wake up forgetful, um, and so we have to constantly remind ourselves of that. And so that's what I would say: the the gospel is the antidote to depression, but because the gospel is scaled to eternity, that um, you know the fixing of that depression will come when we you know, cast off mortality and put on the immortal self. 
Thank you. We're talking with Jared Wilson about the new book, Gospel Wakefulness. We're going to take a short five-minute break and be back in a few minutes. One of the topics we'll hope to get in the next section is about gospel-driven sanctification. hope you'll be back to join us. One of the great sorrows of my life and one of the reasons I love the gospel of Jesus so much is because I grew up in this home as a full-blooded racist. It was an ugly time. It wasn't beautiful. It wasn't separate but equal. It wasn't respectful. Separate motels, separate restaurants, separate churches, separate restrooms, separate drinking fountains, right beside each other on the same wall. We couldn't even drink from the same fountain. What was that supposed to communicate? Separate public swimming pools. It was a cesspool of sin. And I was swimming in it. So I love the gospel. I love the gospel because it cleanses me from sin, forgives my guilt, imputes to me a, a righteousness that's not my own, gives me the Holy Spirit that begins to put to death the old racist nature and open up a whole new possibility of, of life and hope and joy and justice. back on Desiring God Live. We're talking with Jared Wilson about his book, Gospel Wakefulness. Uh, Jared, I told you we start off this second segment by talking about the relationship between the gospel mm -hmm. and God, the concept or message of the gospel and the person being of God. I want to toss out this quote from page 148. You said, what gospel wakefulness presupposes is that wherever a person tops out emotionally, they do so at the gospel. Hmm. My question is, in what way would it be the same or different if we said that they top out in God? In other words, yeah. you say that they top out at the gospel. How would it be different if we changed at the gospel to in God? Yeah. Well, in, in the context of that statement, it wouldn't be different at all. Um, it is to say that you know, to top out in, in your affections for the gospel is to top out in the sense of enjoying God and in worship of God that your your greatest affection uh, what stirs you the most or the um, the stirring of you that orients all your other stirrings um, is that response to what God has done and to God himself to enjoying God himself um, but I think it's um, the distinction can be helpful you know uh, replacing gospel with God there can be helpful because I think many times or one of the pitfalls, one of the, the ditches this sort of gospel-centered movement or the gospel renaissance can you know, run into is when we begin to look at um, you know, gospel as this word of utility mm -hmm. and um, you know, the jargon is real big. I'm a big fan of gospel tweets and, and you know, gospelicious things, that sort of deal. I don't believe we can wear out the real gospel through talking about it a lot. Um, but I, I won't deny the danger that for some, their affection is um, not uh, the gospel that is God or, you know, or God's gospel, but talk of the gospel or mm -hmm. gospel jargon or, um, you know, just being a part of this tribe and the thing that's sort of hip right now. But I'm trusting that um, because the gospel is power that, you know, somehow in this God is sustaining this movement that this is a work of God that he's doing and that the gospel will work almost in spite of of that, um, you know, the word doesn't return void um, in that way. And when you say uh, the gospel working or the gospel transforming, the gospel is the subject of that active yeah. verb. Uh, I think you mean behind that God working, right. and then by saying gospel, 
uh, you're saying this is this is the God of the gospel. This is a certain God. This is not the God of Islam. Right. This is not the the God of Judaism apart from Jesus. This is the Christian God who works in that way. Is that the correct way? Yeah, it is. Um, and I think there's a fair amount of um, you know synonymizing there that can take place because even in the New Testament we were where we see where Paul is talking about, you know, the gospel has gone forth, it's bearing mm. fruit, it's growing, mm. um, that the gospel is the power of salvation. Okay. You know, he, he's not just saying this concept. He's saying, you know, what Christ has done, that in the context of the gospel, mm. applied through the Spirit. And so we know that when someone is captured, when someone responds to the gospel, that's not because there's a power to words. It's a power to that reviving word because of the Spirit's work in their life to, um, you know, uh, soften their heart, to regenerate their heart, to receive that, to apply what Christ has done and what God has foreknown and, and foreordained to take place. So that little word and, and encompasses really that sort of, um, you know, the concert of Trinitarian work in, in the gospel. That's good. Yeah. That's really helpful. Um, you say again and again the gospel doesn't get stale. It can mm-hmm. stand for an eternity's worth of exploration and rearticulating mm-hmm. and trusting and being empowered by. At the beginning or shortly thereafter of your gospel wakefulness experience, mm-hmm. did you think, this is going to get old? Yeah, n- no, I didn't, <laughs> to be honest with you, because um, it felt so um, unreal and so fresh and so beautiful. And for me, when I look at it now, um, the endurance, five, six years you know, since that moment, for me is still there. Now, I have to remind myself of the gospel constantly. If, if there is a staleness, what I've come to understand is it's not a staleness of the gospel, it's a staleness in me, or it's a failure um, to orient myself. But um, it's, it's almost like um, having a taste for a particular kind of food, or for your favorite food. You may not eat that food every day, but when you remind yourself to eat it, you are reminded of, this is the best food, and for me, it's boiled crawfish. Okay, so oh, wow. I don't get that that often, but when I taste it, I, I'm thinking, this is the most wonderful thing, you know, in the universe, uh, food-wise. And God has put it in this little gross little mud bug, and <laughs> almost like as a you know great trick on people to, to eat this thing. And it's the same with the gospel. It, it, if I'm stale, it's because I'm not really looking, I'm not really beholding. It's not a failure of the gospel to do that. Mm-hmm. It's my failure to behold. Um. Chapter 6 is called Chief Spiritual Rhythms, Mm -hmm. and you list uh, Bible study and prayer as those two rhythms. Would you you flesh it out for us in this context of of gospel wakefulness and the ongoing freshness of the gospel? Rhythms can sound kind of new agey, can it not? I mean, it's, it's, uh, I think some people, their antenna goes up a little bit on that. And I did a Bible study that came out last year called Abide, where I look at sort of uh, the rhythms of the kingdom is what I talk about and how um, you know, when there is a centeredness on the finished work of Christ, the spiritual work that takes place in sanctification, um, supernaturally, uh, or naturally, but in, which is to say supernaturally, <laughs> um, creates the outflow of the implications of the gospel. And so, you know, these rhythms are, are things that almost naturally um, occur when we are centered on the gospel, when the Spirit's at work in that. And, you know, Bible study and prayer before, for me anyway, speaking personally, before gospel wakefulness, there were things I had to, um, it, was, it was like going against the grain, I suppose. Um, and, and there were things that I wasn't able to see the gospel in the text of scriptures. I didn't, I didn't understand about seeing Jesus in the text of scriptures. Uh, I'm looking at them from sort of a moralistic self-help kind of view or even if I'm not looking at it that way, it's just purely informational. How do I get some more theology in my head kind of thing? Um, prayer, I never felt desperate in prayer. I think desperation is the key to prayer, um, to natural prayer or to um, not, I guess I don't want to say automatic prayer. You know, desperation just leads to that. But when I got to the point where everything was taken away from me, I had no other support structures. All I had was God. I mean, you, you couldn't stop me from praying. I mean, it was like, you know, it was all that I could do. And so since that moment, you know, what I've learned is to, to be in awe, um, you know, of Christ, the response of worship almost naturally results in these rhythms of prayer and Bible study. My prayer life is completely different than it was before. Uh, you know, I still have to discipline myself. There's still that intentional work of 
you know, going into the spiritual disciplines, but driven by the grace that God has given me, the response, the way that I go in, uh, the things that I'm looking for when I go in, um, and just the, the, um, the spiritual posture that I have going in is completely different because of what I see that God has done for me in Christ. So your rhythms chapter is on these two elements, mm-hmm. uh, scripture, prayer. Yeah. Uh, you probably suspect, which if I was looking for a third, what I'd be looking for? The role of other believers, oh, the sure. role of communities. Right. How do you integrate that with the, would you call that a kind of rhythm or I do. Well, and again, this will take me back to another book, not the one that you wanted to talk about, but <laughs> Abide, there are five chapters, and, and I, I list community as one of those rhythms. The others are fasting, um, generosity, and service is another um, so, yes, there's multiple ones. That's why I, I titled the chapter Chief Spiritual Rhythms because it, you know, it's sort of, uh, you know, looking at it from the personal scale, the two, uh, you know, most, um, I guess, for the individual Christian following Christ those are the two most prominent rhythms. But um, you can't follow Christ apart from um, being wedded in some way to his body. It, mm-hmm. it, 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 doesn't make, it doesn't make sense to do that. I just was preaching from um, Ruth chapter 1, the second half this past Sunday, and we have that beautiful vow that Ruth makes to Naomi, where you go, I'll go, your people will be my people. And for, for Ruth, there's no distinction between, you know, she didn't say, okay, I'm going to convert, I'm going to, I'm going to turn my back on Chemosh and, you know, and the Moabite panoply of gods and, you know, become a worshiper of Yahweh, and I'm going to do that right here, on, you know, on my own. In her mind, there was no distinction between, I'm a convert to Yahweh, I'm going to follow the one true God. And that means I have to go where his people are and be among his people and be wedded to his people in, in that sense. And so, um, you know, definitely the, the word shared in community, the word preached over community and within community to each other, um, we have to receive the gospel from each other. It's one of, um, Bonhoeffer has fantastic things to say about that in Life Together, about the need to hear from a brother the gospel and his need to hear it from me. Um, but also just, you know, prayer life. One of the neatest things we do in our church and even though we're growing, we're still at a size where it's unwieldy but manageable. In our church service, we have a prayer and share time, mm-hmm. and anyone can share a prayer request or um, uh, you know something that God's doing in their life. And right before you picked me up at the hotel, I was looking over the sheet I, I write down the request from this past Sunday just to remind myself of what the prayer requests were. And it was everything from a fellow whose uh, you know friend um, had a brain hemorrhage is in, in the hospital, hang on to his life, to this little boy in the back who raised his hand and. His prayer request was that the dog would stop bringing ticks into the house. Mm-hmm. And so you have just in this list of, you know, you have a picture of the heart of a community. Mm-hmm. Um, you, know, th- you know, things that are big to each person, but, you know, big or little on the scale of um, what God is doing. And you just, you get a picture of, of a community. You get to see the heart of people when you're praying together and, sh- and sharing each other's burdens in that way. Mm-hmm. So you're the pastor and preacher. And so you speak the gospel into the life of the community on Sunday mornings mm-hmm. and I would think throughout the week. Right. Uh, what counsel would you have for those uh, preaching the gospel, not only to themselves, but preaching it to others, but not just from a pulpit? Yeah. Well, it's that word encouragement. Um, for the pastor, it, it often comes out in the counseling office. And trying to key in how do people change how do people really change I mean that's what we're looking at when someone is complaining whether it's a friend or you know a counseling client someone's in your office or you're just you know sharing what they're wanting to know is how do I respond to this situation in my life how do I respond to what somebody did to me or what they said or how do I respond to this circumstance that I find myself in how do I change in response to this and what we see in the scriptures is the only way to change is through the power of the gospel and so like in 2nd Corinthians 3 the way that we are transformed from one degree of glory to another is by beholding with unveiled face the glory of the Lord. Um, and so if we want to see people change, if we want to see people responding to each other and to their circumstances in ways that glorify God, we want to keep reminding them of what God did for us that glorified Himself in a way that is special and for us and um, demonstrates His great His great and deep love for us. So, you know, it comes out, you know, a friend comes and says, Gosh, I'm going through this, you know, difficult time in my life. My, you know, my spouse and I are, are at wit's end, or you know, I'm I'm out of work, or I don't know how I'm gonna, you know, feed my family, or what have you. To remind them, you know, advice is great, 
you know, tips and steps are great, but to remind them enduringly, God loves you, He is for you, and when we look at the cross and the resurrection, we see that uh, on the scale of eternity, He has your back. He's for you relentlessly um, and has secured a place for you through His Spirit. His seal is on you. I, I find that one of the most practical things that we can say to someone in, in a life experience. There's nothing more practical, I think, than the thing that keeps us alive and that keeps us alive eternally. Mm -hmm. So we're moving from the spiritual rhythms toward discussion of sanctification. Mm. You end that chapter, on, right before talking about gospel-driven sanctification, with this phrase about obeying the gospel. I thought yeah. this was helpful. Yeah. Uh, this is the end of the spiritual rhythms chapter. There are three texts in the New Testament that use that language of obeying the gospel. Right. Romans 10, 16, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, 1 Peter 4, 7. Here's, here's a quote. This is page 129. He said, The phrase, obey the gospel, ought not necessarily make us rethink our concept of the gospel but perhaps should cause us to rethink our concept of obedience. Indeed, I believe this understanding of obeying the gospel is the key to the sanctification of Christians unto holiness. Sanctification is wrought in us by the Spirit working through our obedience, but this is catalyzed in the Spirit's approving of us as we return again and again to the gospel. So that's how you set up the chapter on gospel-driven sanctification. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you mean by that phrase, and why is that so important? Well, I, I believe that the gospel produces its own implications. Uh, a shorthand way of saying that would be that being pre precedes doing, or our doing flows from our being. Tolian, you know, Chavijan, you know, talks about indicatives and imperatives, and we have to get the indicatives in the right place before the imperatives, otherwise we become legalists or what have you. Um, what I'm looking at um, in those texts is, first of all, it doesn't raise an eyebrow as we begin to say, you know, the gospel is news, it's not advice. The gospel is an announcement, it's not instructions. And yet here in the text we are seeing, this is what happens to those who do not obey the gospel. And like, Okay, so for me I had to wrap my mind around, what does it mean to obey the gospel? What, what is that like? And I, I think it's, it's like, it's a call to attention. It's... Um, I see it as like a tin hut, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, you're in the military. There's tin hut. You stand at attention. You, you know, you're focused on a particular thing. To obey the gospel is to, um, like in Titus two, where uh, we read that it, it is grace that trains us mm -hmm. for godliness. It is it is it is grace that trains us that helps us to turn our back on unrighteousness. And so, right there is a great you know text of a great passage that reminds us that okay, if we want to pursue righteousness, if we want to pursue holiness. We can't do that apart from being oriented around the true source of righteousness and holiness, the only perfect, um, only perfectly righteous person and perfectly holy person from which our righteousness and holiness comes, um, you know, the imputed righteousness of Christ. And so to obey the gospel um, and to have that um, be how we look at sanctification um, is sort of... Uh, there's a theological concept, there's a practical concept, although the theological is practical and the practical is theological as well. But I see it like when Paul is saying, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And if we stopped right there, it would, you know, it, we might would say, okay, and it'd be, we would have fear and trembling about the exhortation itself. But then he so neatly and sweetly says, it is God who is working in you to will and to work according to his good pleasure. And so it's just seeing where the source of the power mm -hmm. to obey comes from. Um, that if we would be changed, if we would, would be made holy, we have to park ourselves at the cross and dwell there. There's no, there's no holiness that comes a, apart from Christ. There's no holiness that, uh, there's no righteousness that comes apart from Christ. Um, and so the, you know, our justification should be driving us um, in, our, in our pursuit of sanctification. We have to continually come back to the gospel because out of that all is where the worship comes from. If we want our obedience to be worship and not just sort of a dutiful, you know, dutiful obligation, the, um, trying to check off a checklist, um, you know, cross all the T's. Um, I don't believe that's what God wants. The Pharisees had that, had that down. He wants worshipers who are worshiping Him in spirit and, and, and in truth. Um, and so we have to keep coming back to that source of all, and it's not us and our obedience. It's, what, it's Christ's perfect obedience. In chapter 7, you compare a couple three-word phrases. Get to work versus it is finished. Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, I think the danger, um, or 
the danger some people sound when we make that distinction is if we take off the get to work or if we emphasize that it is finished, people won't get to work. They're, ju mm -hmm. they're just going to be lazy or um, they're just going to be involved in, like, um, you know, Bonhoeffer talks about cheap grace uh, in the cost of discipleship. They're just going to take for granted what Christ has done and they're not really going to obey. They're not going to pursue holiness. And that's a question that, you know, I receive in my church sometimes when I, when I say, we need to focus on this, we need to emphasize this and trust that the obedience comes out of all over the gospel as, a, as the worshipful response. Um, as people say, well, what about pursuing holiness? Um, and it's not to cut off the, I mean, the commands are in Scripture not to be ignored, but to be obeyed. But what's the impetus? What's the motivation? Where is the, where's the power mm -hmm. to do that? Where does that come from? And it comes from being awed by it is finished. Yes, people are going to hear it is finished and do nothing with it. But those who are true worshipers of God are going to hear it is finished and their get to work is going to be joy. It's going to be like what David talks about. He delights in the law. That's what we want. We want people to be able to delight in the law, to see the law as life, to that it's sweeter than honey. And the only way to see that is, to, is for them first to be astonished by the fact that Christ is the only one who's perfectly accomplished the law. And not only that, he says, my perfect accomplishment is now your perfect accomplishment. There is such a freedom in that that doesn't make me lazy. It makes me obey in freedom and joy and gratitude and um, when I'm focused on, on the right thing. So would you say that uh, one who gives lip service to believing the gospel and then cares nothing for holiness, yeah. uh, what they need is not law. Right. What they need is the real gospel. Right. Yeah. Um, what is the... There's a little poem attributed to John Bunyan. Oh, I think Justin Taylor has recently helped us see it. might not have originated with Bunyan, but I, I've seen it. I've seen Jerry Bridges attribute it to Bunyan. I attribute it in the book to Bunyan. Um, Run, John, run, the law commands, but gives neither feet or hands. A better word the gospel brings. It bids us fly and gives us wings. Mm. Um, I, I like the illustration that Ray Ortland has used about, um, you know, there's a truck off, in, off the road in the ditch. And um, when we trust the law to, to satisfy its own obligations or to, you know, um, to provide the power to meet its demands, it's like if we tied a kitten to the truck and expected the kitten to pull it out. And then in Orland's illustration, he, he, he says, well, we think to ourselves, well, sure, it will work. I'll just crack a whip on the kitten, mm -hmm. and that'll pull the truck out. It, it's the same sort of thing. The law is good for what it does It's, des it's um, and how it's designed to be. The law is not bad, and the law is not, is not over. We're not antinomians about this, but it cannot produce what it demands. Only the gospel can um, provide or satisfy what the law demands. And so... You see it just in a practical way, you know, in an average household. Does nagging ever produce the result um, that's intended? Sometimes it, it does, but not the spirit of the result intended. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, John Piper gives that great illustration about, um, you know, the husband saying to his wife, uh, must I kiss you? And she says, you must, but not that kind of must. Mm -hmm. It's the same sort of concept. The gospel provides the real sort of must for um, legal um, legal obedience. And at the end of the chapter, it's page 145, you say that the ultimate work of our sanctification is to look to Christ more and more for our own sense of self as our treasure, as our hope, even in our effort. Let our obedience first be to the gospel. Mm -hmm. Don't then pursue righteousness by pursuing righteousness per se, but by pursuing Christ. Mm -hmm. Seek first His kingdom. Um, it is the only way to get yours. While we must be intentional about our holiness, isn't it good news that God is intentional about it first? And I yeah. say, amen. <laughs> and, and, and I see in that phrase the ultimate work of sanctification. That what you seem to mean is that uh, the gospel is not the only work of sanctification. Believing our justification again again and again, mm -hmm. doesn't seem to be the only aspect of sanctification, but the, the source, right. the power, the wellspring. Is, is that what you're yeah, saying? Yeah, well, and, and I think, you know, the scriptures speak about sanctification in that almost double sense. There's a sense of what's, we were washed, you have been mm -hmm. sanctified. So there is at, at the cross the objective work that Christ has done, the Spirit applies so that we are declared, we are reckoned clean. Um, but then there's that work of you know, progressive sanctification, that we 
participate in, but participate in through the Spirit's outworking. It's, you know, again, the good works were created for us beforehand that we might walk in them. Or in Colossians where Paul talks about, I, I'm working with all of His spiritual energy that's inside of me, you know. So um, it's attributing the source of that power even for our part um, in pursuing holiness. I, I, Carson has the, that great phrase or, you know, in his devotional, you know, people don't drift into holiness. But then when he gives sort of the outline of how people become holy, he says, apart from grace-driven sanctification, you know, people don't accidentally stumble into righteousness that way. Um, so it always begins with the source of what God has done, where we find not just the cause of worship, but the power mm. in, in order to obey. Mm. A, an important thing here would be to uh, explore some of uh, what it looks like when grace is driving the vehicle. You know, how does mm. the, the psychological how of sanctification work when yeah. our justification is the source and, and the gospel is the wellspring? Here's this is on 142, you say, uh, the key to the imperative of daily repentance in pursuit of Christ's righteousness is the indicative of daily beholding who we are in Christ. Yeah. I said, amen. And then I was putting the margin, okay, how? Like psychologically, <laughs> how, how does this work out? Yeah. And right after you quoted 2 Peter 1, verses 3 and 4, I was like, oh, he's, he's about to say what I think he might. But you didn't quite say it, but I want to push okay. on it and see what you think. 2 Peter 1, 3-4 says that His divine power has granted us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence. And here's the key part. By which He has granted us His precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. So, so what I'm after in this the psychological how of gospel-driven sanctification is, let's say, in the moment of temptation, mm. uh, when a, a sin is confronting you, or in a moment of, it's flip side of the coin, uh, the need to perform some act of love yeah. toward a family member. How does it work psychologically? Is it a, a retelling of the gospel to yourself in your own words? Mm -hmm. Is it a, a scriptural rearticulation of the gospel in God's own words? What role would biblical promises play in how to motivate ourselves in a gospel-based sanctification? Yeah, I, it it comes up a lot um, in the in the context of relationships and relational conflicts. Um, one of the phrases that I, I use as I walk through with our people, um, marriage and family, that sort of topic is the phrase relational legalism, mm. which um, is a way to look at someone else. Um, we may treat them well, uh, we are quote unquote loving them, but it's all, it's all towards uh, an expectation of something in return, uh, something that's going to complete us, satisfy us, make us happy, some sort of response or result that we want. And yet what we read in the scriptures is to bear with one another, forgive each other, as God has forgiven you, so you must forgive one another. How the gospel can help in those situations is, I, I'm supposed to love this person because of what God has done for me, not for some sort of response. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, it has to be, there, ha there has to be at some point that mental recalibration or, or reorientation in, in, in the moment. Um, the same thing that might would drive somebody to, you know, donate money to charity or give to a poor person without telling anybody. You know, there are some who do that, and it's a nice thing, and then they want you to know that, that they did that, you know. Um, and it doesn't, they don't think that they're glorying in what they've done or, or bragging about what they've done or seeing pride. But begin to wonder, could you have done that without telling anybody? Would that have been satisfaction enough? There's a lack of confidence in Christ's approval or, you know, God's approval of us in Christ that then makes us want some sort of credit, want some sort of response, want some sort of, um, as if we're pushing buttons on a vending machine uh, when we love someone or when we have to forgive someone to want something in response. And the gospel helps us, you know, trains us to begin to even repent of those things so that we can re genuinely love people out of the love of God and not out of a love of self. What role do you think the future might play in terms of a gospel-driven sanctification? Mm. The, the, to the passage in 2 Peter talks about uh, becoming partakers of the divine nature through His promises. Yeah. I'm trying to think, uh, is it helpful to think about the cross as, as the past or uh, in particular 
what role might the future have to play in power for the present moment and how that relates to the gospel? Sure. Well, we could talk about future grace, if that's what we want to do. Um, well, you know, as I said before, the gospel is scaled to eternity, and there is that, that, that sense, that beatific vision that the Bible holds out for us, you know, whether you look at it as your reward or, um, you know, the um, partaking in the, in the glory that is to come. Um, you, you know, Peter says, I was a witness to the sufferings of Christ, and I am a partaker now in the glory that is to be revealed. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's some sense in which now um, that longing, that expectation, there is a satisfaction that happens now knowing that there's something we don't have yet. And one of the, you know, approaches to gospel wakefulness I take is, you know, for some it, it may not be this instantaneous moment, like someone drawing this, you know, the shades in a, in a dark room to let the sun in for someone. It could be a gradual dawning over time. Every Christian is going to be gospel wakened at some point. For some, it, it may be in their dying breath. It may be at that moment where they're standing before the Lord. But that perfect um, um, astonishment, even the gospel wakefulness that we experience this side, is, is nothing compared to the wakefulness, the final, um, uh, you know, having put on the imperishable at, you know, at the moment of the of Christ's return. So to know that we're going to get there, mm -hmm. <laughs> to know that it's promised, you're going to get there, you're going to be there, it can be such help when you feel like you're just going nowhere. Um, when you look at how we might chart someone's Christian life and spiritual progress, and if we looked at it as just sort of uh, an upward trajectory, you know, there are days where I was better yesterday than I was today. Mm -hmm. I was better last year than I was this year. Am I getting worse? Am I not being sanctified? Am I not? Am I not getting better? And and so you know, how people will say to me, "Gosh, I'm really struggling now." And and then they and then they lead to me. Am I not saved? Am I not being sanctified? Am I not? And I wonder if instead of charting it as just sort of this upward thing, we we are ascending, but it's like you're ascending a mountain. You're circling the mountain, and you're you're going up. But there are times where you got to go down into a little valley, and maybe there's switchbacks, and there's, you know, so you're ascending. You just don't sense it yet, and there are ups and downs even to the ascent. But just knowing you, you're going to you're going to get there because He promised you're going to get there. It's not because of something you've accomplished or you've done, but He, the um, the end result is assured and is secured, and it, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. I, I find that. It, can be great encouragement for the days when I just feel like I, I can't even get this day to happen. <laughs> and I, I think a place you put this together pretty good was in chapter 9. Chapter 9 is on gospel confidence. Mm. I think you talked about uh, the end of Romans 8 there as a kind of holy rant mm. where the Apostle Paul is talking about if God is for us, who can be against us? Yeah. And so you know, as we come to a, a difficulty, as, as we find anxiety flooding in on us about yeah. what's going to happen tomorrow, uh, to build a say to ourselves, because of Jesus, because of His work for us, because of the gospel and that He's for me, no one can be successfully against me. He will uphold right. me with His righteous right hand. And so there's that relationship between these specific, uh, specific biblical promises and the God of the gospel who has purchased them and has That's that right. inclination toward us yeah. because of His Son. So uh, you write with a lot of intensity. Okay. <laughs> and uh, nobody, I, I don't think anybody's getting off the hook in terms of sanctification when they read through your chapter on gospel driven sanctification. I, I don't think a licentious person is going to like the chapter. Okay. Uh, it's challenging. And you highlight the, uh, a freedom from hyper spirituality, you call it. You, you've got another side to it as well, yeah. where you want to argue for the importance of margin in our lives right. and rest and. Shocking as this may be to some of us here at Desiring God, you talk about playing golf in good conscience. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't play golf, by the way, so that's <laughs> okay. not a, I've never played a round of golf in my life. But. <laughs> Here's, let, let me read a section here from, the, I believe this is your fifth chapter I'm on page 111. When Christ sets you free, he sets you free from a marginless life. The tyranny of hyper-spirituality insists that man was made for the Sabbath, but the gospel declares that the Sabbath was made for man. Of all the things Christi Christians enjoy becoming radical about, Sabbath from works righteousness, which is an affront to God, by the way, not a tribute to Him, rarely, if ever, is on the agenda. Nobody wants to be thought of as lazy, and there is a lot of laziness out there, including in the evangelical church. 
yes, people watch too much TV and play too many video games and spend too much time on the Internet and what have you. Yes, apathy is endemic. But the proper response to laziness is not a rigorous attention to the explicitly spiritual in every margin of life. The older brother was no more holy than his prodigal sibling. The gospel makes us Christians, not ascetics. Jesus Christ did not die and rise for you so that you would stress out about whether you're being spiritual enough. So take a nap, go for a walk in the woods, play with your kids, eat some chocolate, watch a good movie. Christian, you are free. Uh, you posted something like this not, not terribly long ago, right. and you got a lot of flack. Yeah, people hated it. They really hated it. Tell me it. about that. There is something, there is a, um, <laughs> there's something about um, hyper-spirituality or the tyranny of hyper-spirituality that, that I call the chapter that creates this mental defect where we just sort of block out things that are said to read other things that are said as if the other things aren't said. So in, in the context of whatever, when I said, I said people watch too much TV. I said people are lazy. And, in, and the excerpt that was posted online in advance of the book was literally probably 10 sentences long. It wasn't even as long as the thing that you just read there. But it said people are lazy, people watch too much TV. And then I, you know, I talk about the freedom that we have in Christ. And I was accused of saying we should watch more television and that we should be lazy. Hmm. Um, now, I didn't know what to do with that. It, it was very difficult, to, and I tried to respond as best as I could. Um, but the way that I look at it, I think the, idol the language of idolatry is very helpful here in terms of diagnosing what is taking place. It, it can be just as idolatrous. It is just as idolatrous to pursue these good works um, and trust those good works as it is to do no good works whatsoever. So a workaholic is just as an idolatrous as a lazy person. They're just, they have, you know, two different idols. But ultimately when you get down to it, the idols still themselves. One person is indulging themselves. Uh, one person is finding satisfaction or glory uh, in themselves that way. But one of the illustrations that I use in the chapter that I think is, is, is helpful is, you know, so the, the scriptures say, whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. Well, what does that mean? Does it, does it glorify God to play around a golf? You know, because you're not praying. You could have spent that time evangelizing. Mm -hmm. You could have spent that time reading your Bible and instead... You're golfing, and sometimes when you're playing golf, you don't even think about God. It's like you don't, He doesn't even come to your mind. Does that, does that glorify Him? And I'm thinking about, like, when I give um, something that's not a sin, okay, so let's think of gifts. Think of good gifts that God gives us, the things that He gives us in this world, things that um, of themselves are not, are not sins. They can be used sinfully, but they're just good gifts. When I give my daughters a present, and in the, in, in the chapter I use a dollhouse, I give them this. I try to find the best dollhouse that I can that I think they're really going to enjoy and have fun with. And I give them this dollhouse, my little girls, and you know it's their Christmas present, and I give them the dollhouse. Do I want them to not play with it, but to stand in front of me and just keep saying, thank you for the dollhouse, thank you for the dollhouse, thank you for the dollhouse, thank you for the dollhouse. That's great, and I want them to be thankful. But if their means of thanking me is never to play with the dollhouse, but just to stand there explicitly thanking me, that was the purpose of the gift. And in fact, when they become in some way oblivious to me and begin to play with the dollhouse and get caught up with the fun and the joy and, you know, where are we going to put the couch and, you know, where's mom and dad going to be in the dollhouse? And they may not even know I'm in the room, but they're playing with the dollhouse and they're finding joy. What kind of dad would I be to see that and go, these ungrateful little brats, they're playing with the thing that I gave them. But instead, I give it to them for their joy and to play. I'm glad that they were thankful to me, but I also enjoy and am, in some sense, glorified. I find pleasure in them enjoying one of the good gifts that I've given them. And so God hasn't just given us rest. He's commanded it as well. And so to disobey that command is not to glorify God in any sense. But He's given us great things, good things, good gifts, food and sports and games and um, the creative arts and, and different things. And if we're not engaging in them to a, you know, in, in a sinful way to enjoy the good gifts that He's given us, gl glorify Him because He's given us these gifts to enjoy. And so that's the approach that I, mm -hmm. I try to take in that chapter. It does seem to speak about the importance of a, a life with rhythms. Right. To use that kind of language. That Absolutely. You just, again, let me pick up something quickly here from uh, chapter 10, The Gospel Awakened Church. Uh, there you give four basic arguments for the imperative of gospel centrality in the church. Mm -hmm. The first one, we are forgetful. Second, the gospel alone is the power to save. 
Third, the gospel is of first importance. And then I want to focus here just briefly on the last one. Okay. The last one is the gospel most glorifies God. Yeah. Uh, a desiring God, we care a lot about the glory of God and a lot about the gospel. Put those two together for us. How yeah. is it that the gospel most glorifies God? Well, because the gospel is not um, advice or instructions, the gospel is news of something that God has mm-hmm. done. When we focus on what God has done, and even um, in the application of salvation, we are saved by God's grace through faith, which in the biblical context is itself a gift from God. He's given us the faith to be able to receive the grace that He's given us. When we look at it that way, to focus on the gospel, to center on the gospel, most glorifies God because it takes our works, it takes our glory, it takes our contribution completely out of the equation and just puts in the center something that God did that we could not do and could never do and didn't want to do but something that God didn't have to do except that He wanted to, something that we didn't deserve, um, but that God wanted to give us for His own glory. And so when we put Christ's finished work at the center and take our works out to the periphery, that most glorifies God. Whereas if we tried to say, well, the gospel and Mm -hmm. something else, or let's emphasize the gospel, but let's also emphasize these other things that the church does, it's almost like we're coming in trying to say, well, God's glory isn't enough. It needs some help. It needs some augmentation. Um, but instead, the gospel, because it's something only God can do and God, only God did, that's what glorifies God the most. Well, the book has been out now since Reformation Day, so less right. than a month. Yeah. Uh, as the author, what do you hope this will uh, do in people's lives as they get copies here in the next few months, next few next years? and read this. What's your hope for effect? Well, immediately, I I hope that it would give um, some sort of credence, some sort of encouragement, perhaps um, some sort of words to what a lot of people experience, but they don't have a a frame of reference for a context to. Um, Perhaps they've had an experience after some sort of conversion experience, and now they're wondering, was I saved before? Have I not been a Christian all along? And because the book... um, my aim in the book is to keep pointing us to Christ and what Christ has done as, um, as the assurance of our salvation. Um, I hope it might be an encouragement that way. But, you know, the book is aimed generally at the layperson. I didn't want to write, you know, just for pastors or, um, you know, uh, professional ministers or something like that. I wanted to write to the Christian. And one of the aims of the book and one of the, you know, the first rejections I got from a publisher um, His complaint was, there wasn't anything to do. (laughs) I wasn't telling people what to do. I just was saying things. And so, and that's intentional. What what I want to do in in this book, what I hope to do in in everything I write, is to hold up Christ and just say, let's look at, I mean, look how Mm -hmm. beautiful He is. Look Mm -hmm. how precious He is. Look how wonderful what God has done in Him is. Um, And and let's revel in that. Let's let's taste that. Let's wonder at that. So, what I hope people see in, in the book is just a sense of worship or a sense of awe. And I hope ultimately what they see in the book is Christ. It's kind of the purpose of the last chapter especially. But I, I want people to you know, read the book and see Jesus in a, a new, fresh, or exciting way. Last thing, uh, for those who've been watching here today and may say, uh, Jared, it sounds great, but I haven't experienced this. Mm-hmm. I haven't, this gospel wakefulness doesn't resonate with my experience. Uh, what would you say to them? What, what should they do? Yeah. Well, I would give the, the exhortation that um, I like to give in response to the question is to keep looking, you know, keep looking at Jesus. One of my favorite quotes comes from um, Ray Ortland. He says, stare at the glory of God until you see it. Um, now, we can look and not see, um, but we can't see if we're not looking. And so if it hasn't happened yet, um, we have to, um, as the author of Hebrews says, fix our eyes on Christ. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. So it, it won't happen apart from daily dwelling in the gospel. It won't happen apart from looking to Jesus um, over and over and over again. Um, and trusting that um, if your faith is in Christ, you're saved whether you feel wakened or not. The measure of our assurance is not our measure of wakefulness. Our measure of assurance is what Christ has done for us. Um, historically, factually. Would you close us in prayer? Well, thanks, Dave. Heavenly Father, um, I thank you for this opportunity. I pray for those who 
uh, are watching this right now and even those who are not, those who are interested in the expanse of your kingdom. Father, I pray that you would give them a vision just even in their um, small uh, domain, whether it's a home or office, and, and just the ins and outs of their daily life. You would give them that, um, that Habakkuk vision that the glory of God will cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. Father, I hope that you, I hope that you would help us to see Jesus, mm -hmm. that you would help those who are watching right now um, to see Jesus uh, in your word, through your word, powerfully proclaimed and humbly proclaimed. Uh, may you do this for your glory, and it's in your Son's name and by His authority I pray. Amen.